why don't uh, we get started? Uh, welcome uh, this evening. Uh, you know, warm welcome also to the uh, 30 plus people that uh, are currently on Zoom to uh, a presentation by Antonio Missiroli, um, who will be talking about new challenges to transatlantic and European security. I personally can't think of any challenges, but I'm sure that he can. Um, Antonio is a non-resident associate fellow at, at NATO and until uh, the 31st of October uh, 2020 was NATO's Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges. Uh, prior to NATO, um, he was Director of the European Union Institute for Security Studies in Paris uh, from 2012 to 2017 and has held a number of very prestigious uh, policy and academic roles, including teaching here at SICE Europe for about four years. And uh, so without uh, further ado, Antonio, normally in these talks, we usually target maybe 40 minutes for the presentation and then open it up yeah. for questions. That's okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so I think I will try and live up to that and find a reasonable compromise between the two requirements. So it's a great honor, privilege, uh, and pleasure to be back at SAIS today uh, and to see familiar faces uh, as well as new ones and uh, uh, guessing also there are others online. Uh, the title of my lecture is deliberately vague and a bit generic. And in part, I confess it's a ploy uh, to buy time uh, to see what may be dominating the news and uh, the policy agenda on the day, but in part also uh, because the challenges I will devote my remarks to uh, keep changing and evolving at a breathtaking uh, speed. So consider this. I was expected, if you remember, to, to come over to size already last uh, November, but then I caught COVID, uh, the Delta variant, and we had to postpone. So back then, uh, if you remember, the challenge or crisis of the day uh, dominating the headlines was the inflow of uh, refugees, mostly from Iraq, into the EU and especially Poland and uh, Lithuania via Belarus. Hmm? Uh, a crisis or a challenge uh, prompted by what was then labeled the weaponization of migrants by the Lukashenko uh, regime in Belarus, and even some people went as far as to say as a form of hybrid warfare. Hmm? So incidentally, those claims were not entirely new, having been uh, raised repeatedly, uh, the weaponization of migrants against Turkey already in the past, and more recently against Morocco, uh, and the hybrid warfare claim against Russia uh, itself uh, in Crimea and in the Donbass in 2014. But we'll come back to that in a, in a moment. So only three months have passed since November. And now, first of all, the COVID variant is called Omicron and looks a little bit more benign, but we are all holding our breath about what may or may not happen at the border between Ukraine and Russia. And there is a lot of talk about how to deter or prevent Moscow from nothing less than invading Ukraine with conventional military forces, pure unadulterated warfare, and possibly combined with less conventional information warfare, cyber attacks against government infrastructure, and the weaponization, again, of energy supply, not only to Ukraine, uh, but also to a number of EU and NATO members. This time around, the US, administration is much more involved in the discussion on how to prevent and or respond to such a challenge politically, diplomatically, and also militarily. This is also to say that labeling these challenges as primarily European or transatlantic is often difficult and somewhat arbitrary, as it depends also on what is or is not at stake in each case, uh, with some, uh, while some of the tactics employed may look similar. I'm sure we will return to this in the Q&A session. So please allow me to dwell rather on the bigger picture now uh, and on a number of issues that lie behind and beneath all this, starting with terminology. First, weaponization. The term has become common currency in the transatlantic and European security debate. 
since it was first used by US General David Petraeus a few years ago, with reference to the tactics used by insurgents in Iraq and Afghanistan. He famously spoke of, and I quote, the weaponization of everything, women and children as suicide bombers, commercial drones or simple balloons, ethnic and or religious cleavages, as well as, of course, social media. ISIS itself, both during the caliphate in the Levant and through its instigation of terrorism in the West, demonstrated also how sophisticated weaponry was not required to destabilize and frighten communities. Driving a vehicle through a peaceful crowd or using knives and axes was sufficient to spread terror and appropriate instructions were duly uploaded on the web for free and without much control. For its part, the weaponization of social media reached a first climax, as you know, in 2016, with significant intrusions into our democratic processes from the Brexit referendum in the UK to the presidential campaign in the US and later in France. And then came the migrants, uh, of course, which dovetailed with the terrorist threat on the one hand, but also with the narrative whereby immigration is threatening our social fabric and even our physical survival. I don't know how familiar you are with the French presidential campaign and the debate over there, but you know that there is one prominent candidate called Eric Semour, who is talking explicitly, published a book to that effect of the so-called the great replacement, whereby French population will be replaced even physically by migrants uh, from in particular uh, North Africa. All this fed and was in turn fed by other populist narratives and conspiracy theories that have sown distrust within and polarized our societies. To the extent that COVID-19 broke out, the pandemic was similarly weaponized uh, in relation to its origin and source, its actual, its very existence, and how to mitigate its effect. And the pandemic became more often than not a divisive rather than a unifying factor at national, regional and international level, fostering blame games and systemic competition, even between neighbors and friends. Mind you, not all these narratives have come from outside, from external instigators, although there is solid evidence uh, that that uh, has happened. But the very nature and operation of social media has had a spectacular multiplier and cumulative effect with disruptive consequences. So, so much for weaponization. Let me turn to hybrid, although for most of you, hybrid is mostly associated with teaching, but of course, uh, uh, it has a slightly different uh, uh, implication in the security debate. Uh, the term hybrid is associated with warfare made its first appearance a good decade ago among American military analysts. As such, it was used, for instance, by Frank Hoffman to capture the emerging features of 21st century warfare as carried out by both state and non-state actors. Interestingly, he focused in particular on the tactics used by Hezbollah in the conflict with Sahal, the Israeli Defense Force, in South Lebanon in 2006, combining highly disciplined, well-trained and properly equipped regular units, adaptive guerrilla tactics in both urban and mountainous areas, high-tech weaponry, including drones, and swift and very effective information operations. Thus, taking Sahal, the Israelis, by surprise, and forcing them into a military and political stalemate. While each and every element of the Hezbollah tactics was per se not new, their combination and integration, and especially the clever use of contemporary information and communication technology, ICT, made it new and in many respects unique. General James Mattis, whom you remember, was uh, Secretary of Defense in, at the beginning of the Trump administration, but at that time, it was NATO's uh, Supreme Allied Commander Transformation in, in Norfolk, agreed 
with Hoffman and contributed to launching and popularizing the hybrid warfare concept. Then came the crisis in and over Ukraine in 2014 uh, with the Russian occupation and annexation of Crimea and the ensuing rebellion in the Donbas with this mix of deception, you may remember the little green man in Crimea, corruption, coercion, subversion and manipulation, which gave a new and somewhat unexpected lease of life to the concept of hybrid warfare. NATO reacted immediately uh, and at the Wales summit in 2014, highlighted the specific challenges that hybrid warfare posed and in 2015 even adopted dedicated uh, military strategy to counter hybrid warfare. In fact, what happened in Ukraine in 2014 seemed also to be the first practical implementation of what has come to be known as the Gerasimov doctrine, uh, from the name of the then uh, deputy chief of military staff uh, uh, in Moscow, Valery uh, uh, Gerasimov, who developed a vision of what he called non-linear rather than hybrid warfare, as articulated in a series of articles published in 2013, that is just a few months uh, before the crisis in, uh, in Ukraine. Incidentally, and I think interestingly, Russian analysts used an equivalent of the term hybrid warfare, and uh, forgive my Russian, Gibrinaya Voina, with reference to the methods used by the West and notably the United States, both before and after the end of the Cold War, to weaken Moscow, uh, albeit admittedly with no military means. In particular, uh, hybrid warfare, the Russian way, was uh, meant to cover the so-called color revolution in uh, at the beginning of the, uh, the, the, the new millennium in the post-Soviet space uh, and were seen as a relevant case in point. Quite soon, however, the emphasis in the transatlantic security debate shifted from hybrid warfare to hybrid threats hybrid campaigns and hybrid challenges. And that happened in the EU and understandably so, the EU is not a military organization, but also in NATO. It became quite clear, in fact, that most of the hostile activities falling under the rubric hybrid occurred below the level of armed conflict and were indeed aimed at inflicting harm without reaching that level and thus prompting a large scale, robust military response. And here is where hybridization meets weaponization, namely in highlighting a broad spectrum of unconventional malicious activities carried out by both state and non-state actors and aimed broadly at destabilizing, dividing and weakening the West. There is no agreed international or just Western definition of what a hostile hybrid activity precisely is. Although the term has now officially entered our political vocabulary, there is even, as you may know, a specialized center of excellence dedicated to countering hybrid threats in Helsinki, in Finland, that is uh, accountable to both the European Union and NATO. Hybrid is a quintessential catch-all term, but its fluidity uh, may also help us to capture trends and phenomena that, as I said, keep evolving and adapting. For instance, low intensity hybrid operations may represent or may become the beginning of something bigger, which may in turn escalate into proper warfare, or more likely and more often, simply aim at testing and probing the other side, uh, the target's capabilities, resilience, and resolve. And the, they could do this by design, or randomly, by trial and error, with a strategic or just an opportunistic approach. These hostile hybrid activities have proven to be, at least in comparative terms, low cost, low risk and high impact. So they are quite accessible and very rewarding. They are also scalable, both vertically and horizontally, and they are mostly tailored to specific vulnerabilities of the other side, be they technological, social, economic, or political. They are hard to detect and to attribute and easy to deny, and thus difficult to deter and to respond to. Last, but certainly not least, these 
activities use the digital sphere, what we call cyberspace, as an essential vector to achieve their goals, as a means and occasionally also as an end, cyber itself. Cyber is now both a military domain in its own right, alongside air, land and sea, but also across them, and this space in which most of our economic, civilian, social and even personal activities unfold. It is a domain of domains, so to speak, and also an entirely man-made ecosystem that is mostly privately owned and privately operated, not by states. By exploding cyberspace, these hostile hybrid operations can be opaque, discrete, and deniable, thus blurring the distinction between crime and war, between espionage and sabotage, between peace, crisis, and conflict. An Oxford academic called Lucas Keller uh, has uh, argued a few years ago that we now live in a state of unpeace, hmm? which is quite an interesting notion to consider. The spread of ICT, uh, information and communication technology, has dramatically lowered the entry barriers for new actors, the so-called democratization effect, while extending the scope and operation of activities that were already quite common, the weaponization effect indeed. Uh, you may be familiar with a book written by a science academic called the Thomas Reed, he's based in Washington, I think, that is titled Active Measures. And active measures were the name of these activities during the Cold War as carried out by the Soviet Union. But of course, he, he uh, um, described a certain continuity in certain patterns of behavior only with the addition of new technologies and the new opportunities that new technologies offer. Uh, to this effect. The resulting battlefield is neither controllable nor fully visible by states. There are no physical borders, no territorial jurisdictions, and the attack surface is virtually infinite. Attacks can occur anytime, anywhere, and from anywhere. Finally, our Western societies and polities are particularly vulnerable as they are generally based on free speech, free trade, open borders, and open markets. As a result, they can be infiltrated and influenced more easily. And on top of that, our societies and our polities have each their own specific vulnerabilities, hmm? such as distinctive social or regional cleavages, ethnic or communal grievances, simple safety concerns, including about health, energy, climate, and now even culture wars, as I mean, they are called in the current vocabulary. By exploiting all these vulnerabilities and weaponizing uh, technologies that reach out to almost everyone, hostile hybrid actors threaten and undermine both our societal cohesion and our collective security. So to conclude, what is to be done? Well, to some extent, we probably have to get used to and live with them. They are unlikely to stop or go away anytime soon. And we do not want, for our part, to undo what makes the West what it is. Our vulnerabilities are also our strengths, at least in the long run. And we are reluctant to resort to the same tactics and methods and weapons used by those who want to do us harm, um, at least in part. So this is going to be a longer game. Huh? We can and must definitely upgrade our capacity to defend against and respond to these threats and challenges, knowing that we may not be able to deter them, deter them the same way that nuclear weapons can be deterred. The weapons we are discussing here are intended to be used all the time and everywhere. Nukes never again. So that is an important mean, different meaning of the term deterrence. The nature of these threats and the interconnected ecosystem they unfold in require both national efforts and transnational cooperation. We will only be as strong as our weakest link. You may have heard of the recent revival of the notion and practice of 
civil defense that was typical of Nordic countries during the Cold War, Sweden and Finland in particular, and to be applied both in war and in peacetime. And uh, that is, uh, both countries now have revived those notions and updated that to the new technological uh, uh, um, landscape. Um, of course, intelligence cooperation, uh, military and civilian, is already well developed at bilateral level and in general between like-minded countries such as uh, Five Eyes, uh, Echelon uh, and all that. So let me conclude with the uh, multilateral uh, regional organization, the UN NATO, uh, which I had the honor to work for in my career. Since uh, 2016, significant progress has been made in these domains by both, each within its own remit and each playing to its distinctive strengths. I would say military assets and standardization for NATO, economic and civilian assets and regulation for the European Union. I could give you, but I will not, a detailed list of the various policy steps uh, taken by them in the hybrid and also in the cyber domain, from NATO's collective warning that such attacks, both cyber and hybrid, could lead to the invocation of Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, to the Union's uh, dedicated sanctions regime that is already in place and is being used, from the creation of internal special teams dealing with these threats, to the emphasis, emphasis on increasing awareness and resilience that you can find in many, many ministerial declarations by both organizations. The same applies to the two NATO-EU joint declarations that were issued in 2016 and 2018. They almost only talk about cyber and hybrid threats. And a new one, as you know, is in the making. And also to the list of more than 70 specific practical actions that underpin, underpins staff-to-staff -staff relations and cooperation between the two organizations. I personally believe, and this is my concluding uh, remark, that even if we take fully and realistically into account the well-known political hurdles that haunt uh, NATO-EU bilateral relations, much more could be done to this effect. After all, NATO and the EU have 21 members in common and broadly complementary capabilities. And in confronting these threats and challenges, neither organization can credibly claim to be able to handle them on its own. I don't know if you're familiar with the acronym DIME field, which stands for diplomatic, information, military, economic, financial, um, intelligence and legal. These are the tools that are needed in order to have a comprehensive and effective approach uh, against uh, hybrid uh, threats. It is now common currency in the, in the security debate. The Americans speak of dime only, and the Europeans prefer to speak of dime fill, uh, but it is more or less the same concept and indicates and summarizes the policy tools required to deal uh, with uh, these threats. I personally hope that the new joint declaration that is in the making uh, between Stoltenberg, uh, von der Leyen and Michel will give us a better view of the way ahead in this respect. But I especially hope that the two strategic exercises currently underway almost in parallel in each organization, you know, the EU uh, strategic compass that is due to be delivered next month during the French presidency and NATO's new strategic concept that is due uh, at the Madrid summit in June, so in a, in a few months, will eventually display also some strategic alignment, a meeting of uh, minds and means, if you like, and possibly even some recognition of the added value that the cooperation can bring. But I'm sure you will have your own doubts or your own questions, so we'll stop here and uh, leave time and ground for the Q&A. I think I managed to stick to that. Really cover a, a lot of ground in a very short period of time. So that was great. Um, why don't we uh, open it up to Q&A. We have 45 uh, participants uh, on Zoom. Uh, let me suggest that if you have questions uh, from Zoom land, uh, if you could put them in the Q&A box and, um, and we'll get to them. Uh, but let me open it up to the floor. Yeah. 
Hi there. This I'm uh, Megan Doherty. Thank you so much for your time. Can you speak up, please? Yes. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Um, thank you so much for your time. I had a, I was really or uh, um, wondering what your perspective is on uh, resources and um, like uh, energy and climate and the risk that we'll have for raw materials. If that is something that is becoming more of an issue um, transatlantically or in Europe, um, yeah, be curious of your thoughts on that. Your question is about energy security and and, and yeah. security and like raw materials. So like, ah, okay. if that's well, changing at all or, yeah. In the short term, the two issues have a different impact as you can easily imagine. Uh, energy security now is, is first of all, a, very much a, a concern of uh, uh, European households among other things because of the rise in, in the cost of energy. Uh, and of course that is related to some extent to the supply chain and the, the difficulties encountered in this domain. Uh, you may have read that one of the, uh, criticisms that are made against uh, Russia right now is that is despite of this crisis and despite the spike in prices, it's keeping its uh, deliveries supply through uh, the, the pipelines that uh, come from Russia to the minimum that is uh, fixed in the contracts. So Russia is not, um, how could I put it, uh, going against the contracts, but is keeping it to a minimum, which of course raises the prices with all the consequences that are related to that. Um, uh, you may have read that over the past few days, there have been a number of uh, uh, interesting diplomatic initiatives. One is of course the US administration itself offering to provide more uh, LNG, liquefied national gas, uh, natural gas uh, to Europeans in order pre precisely to make up for the uh, lacking deliveries from uh, from uh, from Russia. Uh, another one is um, interesting as a, a diplomatic mission by the Commission to Qatar of all places because Qatar is one of the key producers not only of natural gas but also LNG uh, in order to be able to compensate for the lack of uh, uh, supply coming from Russia. It's a bit late in the day, if you like, if I may uh, be honest about this, because of course, if there is a major crisis now with Russia and Russia decides to turn off uh, the pipelines, uh, I don't think that LNG can easily be uh, provided to uh, uh, European consumers. But of course, it shows that there is increased awareness uh, of all that. Uh, Europe remains heavily dependent on Russia gas, not all of Europe, some parts of Europe more than others. Uh, and of course, that is being weaponized precisely because it is an opportunity to exercise extra pressure. It's not the first time that this is happening. I'm old enough to remember two gas crises in the winter of 27 and 2007 and 2009, in which countries like Bulgaria and others were basically freezing uh, for disputes over prices. Uh, so it has already happened in the past, although I think that Russia still has a, an overwhelming interest in being seen as a reliable supplier, because of course then it risks uh, uh, generating precisely what it wants to avoid, that would be less uh, reliance on Russian gas in the future. But these are things that take time. Yes. And of course there is a highly political issue of Nord Stream 2, uh, I don't want to elaborate too much on that. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, the additional pipeline, it's not the only one, there are already four pipelines uh, carrying gas from Russia uh, to Europe um, that has been uh, negotiated. It's awaiting the final green light uh, from the German regulator. It has become a political issue, of course, both in Germany and beyond, also at the transatlantic level. Uh, for what it is worth, I think that if I may quote President Trump, it was a bad deal <laughs> from the outset, uh, but of course it is particularly difficult for the current coalition now uh, to, to handle that in Berlin, in part because the, the Social Democrats through Gera Schroeder uh, are quite linked to, to Gazprom. Uh, Gera Schroeder was appointed to the board of directors of Gazprom two days ago. That was also political communication, if you like, uh, but also because the coalition has just started its work, uh, still trying to uh, to develop its own policies. Um, I understand that Chancellor Schultz is in Washington today, uh, precisely in order to clarify some issues there. So it is a tricky thing, uh, but I think it is, a, um, I mean, uh, this plays very well the way in which issues that originally were not meant to have an impact on security can be weaponized and used. The issue of raw material is more complex, more long term, it's more strategic, but rather than Russia, I think China is the, the big issue there, the way in which uh, China has managed to acquire increasing control of uh, particular rare earths 
that are particularly important and strategically important for uh, the, the uh, from electric uh, uh, cars to uh, other important ICT materials. And I think there is concern that, um, in particular through its penetration in, in sub-Saharan Africa uh, and doing deals with those countries, uh, China may try to acquire a sort of uh, long-term strategic advantage over the West. And I think there is a lot of uh, um, talking about that. I haven't seen, apart from a few um, uh, lines in G7, uh, communicates a lot of action in that particular field, but I know that national governments, including in, in Europe, France uh, in particular, are very well aware of the uh, risk related to that. So far, rare earths, however, have not been weaponized that I know. Okay. So getting some, uh, some comments in from uh, our group uh, online. Uh, the first one is from Ares Iliopoulos uh, from uh, Washington, D.C., a campus mm. at SAIS in D.C. You mentioned well-known political hurdles in NATO-EU cooperation. Could you elaborate on which of these hurdles in particular are the biggest obstacles to effective cooperation in dealing with the challenges you describe? A very easy question. <laughs> well, as a former NATO official, of course, I, I, I signed up to a non-disclosure agreement when I left the job. So I, mean, I can only <laughs> go as far uh, in elaborating on this. Well, I think there is awareness that um, uh, there is in particular one issue that is making uh, direct political and policy cooperation within the organization uh, difficult, that it is the Turkey Cyprus issue. Mm -hmm. um, particularly over the past 20, 25 years, Turkey has been a difficult partner for the European Union and perhaps the European Union for Turkey. There was a, a short period in which uh, uh, things improved. I'm sure that Michael uh, remembers that very well. It was between 2003 and 2005, basically between the uh, uh, rise to power of the new, uh, a, called the new party, AKP, Erdogan himself, and the opening of negotiation with the European Union in October 2005. I still remember an event we both participated. It was quite uh, interesting in that respect. Uh, but ever since, and gradually, uh, relations have, uh, uh, between the EU and Turkey have got worse. Uh, uh, and uh, I would say over the past few years in particular, and especially after the failed uh, coup d'etat against that one, uh, they have gone south. Uh, and uh, inside NATO, Turkey tends to block every form of uh, uh, cooperate, political cooperation. Um, with the EU uh, that goes beyond what has already been agreed. Uh, the only format in which the NAC, that is the ambassadors to NATO, uh, and uh, the PSC, that is the ambassadors to the EU that deal with security and defense, can meet hmm, is when they discuss Bosnia. Hmm, because hmm. Uh, the, 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 there is one operation that was passed on by NATO to uh, the European Union during that short interval of good relations between Turkey and, uh, and uh, the European Union, that is still the only uh, legal format that Turkey allows for meeting uh, in the same room, in particular with the Cyprus ambassador. Mm -hmm. uh, so an unresolved uh, issue at that level is basically blocking that. I would not go as far as to say that is the only one. Mm -hmm. uh, behind that, of course, there are a number of other uh, considerations. You may uh, remember that until a few years ago, uh, the joke was that NATO and the EU were the two organizations that were uh, that lived in the same city but on different planets because they did <laughs> very very different different jobs, that very different cultures. That still applies. Um, I have worked for both organizations, and I can tell you that there are also some how could I put it um, uh, difficulties that are related to the way in which officials in each organization look at the other one. Um, I don't think I'm risking anything by saying this, but uh, I mean, my experience is that many officials in the EU, and not only the Commission, but also elsewhere, tend to neglect uh, and underestimate the role that NATO has played uh, in post-war Europe in general, after World War II, and in particular in allowing the EU to become what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very often there is neglect or, or even uh, a lack of attention to that. Uh, in NATO, sometimes there is a, a lack of knowledge of what the EU actually does, and sometimes also a deliberate uh, um, uh, <laughs> lack of knowledge. That is, we prefer to portray the EU in a certain way because that suits uh, our interests. And that is not just the Americans, I think it's also NATO international staff at large. There is bureaucratic politics a little bit uh, at play in all there, 
Um, it can be overcome, I think, precisely because paradoxically there are, I mean, not paradoxically, there are 21 members in common. So it is very difficult that we say different things in one arena and, uh, and, and in the other. If I can go even further in being honest with you, I think there is only one country uh, that uh, has the, the guts, the courage to say the same things in NATO and the same things in the EU, to say in NATO that more cooperation with the EU is necessary, but also to say in the EU that more cooperation with NATO is necessary. And that is the Netherlands. <laughs> And I think that is uh, the only consistent and, uh, and uh, honest uh, member of the two organizations. And uh, uh, now Turkey now, for instance, is blocking uh, joint exercises. Uh, I mean, when you deal with these issues, not just with big military threats, the one thing you have to do is exercise. You know, exercises are simulations and you are confronted with fictional crises and you test uh, in a very realistic manner for a couple of days, the way in which you would act. Uh, in that situation. I have participated myself in one of these exercises. You was kept out of the, of the room for most of the time. And they were allowed in when their, their assets uh, were called upon. It was very, very interesting, but you also see st still the differences in culture and approaches between the two organizations. Of course, NATO tends to overemphasize the role of the military and intelligence and, and the EU, the role of a civilian means. And I think precisely for this, they could be complementary but it is still very difficult to do that. It depends very much on leadership, but not only in the two organizations, I think over the past few years, there was a certain willingness at the top level uh, to work together, uh, but also at the national level. Um, I hope the situation will improve. Okay. I don't know if I answered the question, but that is as far as I can go. Of course, there is also a difference in, uh, that was very well known, NATO is an organization that works on mostly classified material, Whereas the EU is an organization that works with transparency and accessibility. When it comes to security and defense related issues, that could be a problem. Hmm? Uh, mm -hmm. The level of classification that certain meetings have. But the EU is improving in that respect. Uh, well, why don't we try to rotate between yes. in person and Thank online. you so much. Uh, my name is Marcela, and I'm also an, an MITP student here at SAIS. Can I ask you to speak? Oh, because my name is Marcella, is and I am an. Marcella, I'm an MIPP student here at SAIS, and uh, I'm glad you brought up the question of, or, or you mentioned the NATO exercises, because I was just wondering, you mentioned the uh, weaponization of like social media, and most of what I know is from the U.S. point of view, um, but I know that there were some like anti-NATO propagandas during a couple of um, exercises a few years ago, so I was just wondering if you think that that's much like what sort of impact does, can that really have or what sort of a threat is that? And um, I guess uh, from an EU or NATO standpoint, like what should, should much attention be paid to it? Well, to my knowledge, the first uh, interesting exercise that you organized was in 2017. It was under the Estonian presidency. And interestingly, it was titled Cybrid. Hmm? So a combination of cyber and hybrid, the Estonians being the digital state, uh, they created a, a scenario for the exercise that was very realistic and had a very, very strong uh, impact on that. Um, I think that the, um, the Finnish organized another exercise a couple of years ago uh, in which there were many, many elements of hybrid in that. And as I said, I participated myself in an exercise um, called crisis management exercise, uh, in which, um, trying to respect the, the deal I signed, basically there were a number of hybrid and cyber attacks against the alliance, against individual members and against the alliance as a whole. Um, but Article 5 was invoked only when, after uh, infrastructure was crippled, the casualties had occurred already here and there, only when a, a, an airplane hit a military base without provoking casualties. That means that the reflex in the organization was still to activate or invoke Article 5 when a traditional conventional attack took place and not when other even more harmful activities were already underway. Uh, in some cases where, I mean, the world country said, oh, it's too difficult to attribute, it takes time, we cannot do it in real time. And these are exercises that take place in real time. Uh, and in other cases, it was in general a cultural uh, uh, reluctance to consider these 
as war by other means, hmm? uh, to some extent, if I may paraphrase uh, uh, Klaus a bit. Um, now there is more willingness to do this. If you read the draft uh, that was published in November of the strategic compass hmm, for the European Union, now there is a commitment on the part of the HRVP Borel uh, to organize more live exercises because there is awareness that that is the only way to test a number of arrangements and to see the flows and the vulnerabilities that exist. In other words, uh, uh, plans are nothing, as Eisenhower used to say, but planning is everything. I think being able to learn the lessons of these exercises is very important. NATO has a much stronger tradition uh, in doing the exercises. It comes with a military uh, uh, job. Uh, and I think the European Union is learning to do that. Uh, some exercises have been carried out in other domains inside the European Union, but not in this one in particular. But of course, hybrid brings all the domains together. Okay, we have a question from uh, Professor Francesco Stazzari, who asks, can we say that the ongoing crisis with Russia is going to have a reconstitutive value for the EU strategic compass and for NATO's new strategic concept, as opposed with security problems along with the southern flank, the MENA region, Africa, et cetera? Well, as I said earlier on, the, 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 these threats evolve very, very quickly. Until a few months ago, I think the real challenge for both that strategic exercise was to accommodate China. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, for the European Union, we all know uh, how difficult it is uh, to, to come to a sort of uh, uh, united assessment of the role of China. That is the famous uh, uh, triad that China is at the same time a partner, uh, an economic competitor and a systemic uh, uh, rival. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, to different degrees that applies to which of all member states, but not to the same degree. Yeah. Uh, and of course, that is uh, the, the challenge. And also for NATO, it was first the Trump administration, but also the Biden administration later on, that brought China to the fore. I said, oh, we have also to focus on that. China is, is no longer uh, over there. China is over here. And not only economically, but also strategically, they also carry out uh, uh, drills with Russia in the Mediterranean. Huh? They are in Djibouti. They may also be in the uh, Arab uh, United Emirates soon, militarily speaking. So I mean, they are they are here and not no longer over there. And now, of course, Russia is back. Huh? So now we are all uh, trying to uh, find a, a new balance between all these different threats. Um, Putin is sometimes. Uh, uh, the worst enemy enemy of himself, mm -hmm. uh, and um, actually one of the possibilities would be perhaps precisely uh, that he ends up uniting the West, both NATO and EU, against him rather than dividing. Although he started out by trying to divide, I don't know who, who said that. I read it uh, a few days ago. Uh, apparently, uh, you know, Dostoevsky used to say that uh, Russians can be either good uh, um, uh, chess players or good uh, uh, players of uh, hazard uh, games, hmm? so poker, although I mean, Dostoevsky didn't have poker in mind. And uh, the, 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 the joke is that Putin is a very good poker player, but he's a very bad chess player. A chess player is good because it, it, it thinks ahead about the strategic consequences of each move. But the poker player can reap enormous benefits in the short term, but I mean, maybe not be considering what could be the long term consequences of, of his fear. I think even the Ukraine in 2014 was a case like that. At the beginning, we were all shocked. It was a strategic surprise. Um, uh, Putin seemed to be winning all over. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, Ukrainians turned against Russia. So the, the claim that Ukraine and Russia are one and the same thing uh, started being uh, uh, criticized. Uh, sanctions were uh, uh, imposed on Russia. It was a degree of isolation and so on and so forth. So what was a short term victory uh, proved to be a medium term um, questionable uh, operation. And I think the same could happen in this particular case. Also the demands in this case have been so unrealistic uh, that I think now the real challenge is for Putin himself. Am I going to leave up what I said and go all the way, or how can I retreat uh, without losing place? And I think part of the current uh, diplomatic uh, activity, including Macron being uh, in Moscow today, um, I think Liz Truss is also going to, to Moscow this week, uh, is precisely to see whether there is a way out uh, that would uh, uh, allow the West and NATO in particular to say no to the demands coming from Russia, but also avoid that in order to save face, uh, the only way ahead for Putin would be to go ahead. Hmm? And, uh, 
Oh, let's hope he's bluffing. If he's going Africa, to uh, sorry, <laughs> I can just go ask something about Africa. Uh, if you saw uh, Xi Jinping and Putin uh, meeting in Beijing a couple of days ago, or yesterday, uh, for the inauguration of the Olympic Games, um, Africa was not mentioned. And there are actually a few issues on which Russia and China do not see eye to eye. Uh, I think we have to be aware of One of them is Africa. Hmm? Uh, uh, China started uh, um, entering Africa already many years ago, to some extent as a sort of alternative uh, uh, cooperation option uh, to the European Union itself. Huh? I mean, to some extent undermined, and uh, no conditionality was applied, or at least not the kind of political conditionality that the European Union wanted to have. Uh, and instead, massive investments were made, also in return for control of territory and where else, and so on and so forth. But China didn't make a big military uh, step in there. Uh, now, I don't know if you follow that, Russia is quite active in Africa, in both North Africa and Southern Africa. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Wagner Group, uh, the, 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 the group, the organization of mercenaries hmm, that are sort of uh, uh, proxy group uh, working for the security uh, service in in, the, in, uh, in in Moscow. Well, they uh, have been active in Syria. They've been active in Libya. Uh, they uh, they are still active in Syria and Libya. Now they have been invited to uh, Mali by the the, the, the the junta that is now over there. Uh, and they might be invited to Burkina Faso, there was a coup d'etat yeah. a few days ago. So there is a potential conflict uh, of interest between Russia uh, and China there. The methods used are very different. It's very difficult to imagine that they are complementary at this stage. And of course, there are uh, contrasts between the two also elsewhere in Central Asia, vis-a-vis uh, -vis India, uh, and so on and so forth. And of course, is Russia ready and, and happy to be junior partner to China? even when it comes to uh, economic cooperation and energy cooperation. That is a big issue. Um, I know there are other questions. Michael, yeah. Thanks very much. Great pleasure to see you, Antonio. Um, EU, uh, NATO, I mean, there is a line of argument these days that um, the Ukraine crisis is the sort of coup de grace for the European Union's claim to becoming involved in security and defense, what we used to call high politics. And that, you know, when you consider 20 years of effort to establish uh, stable, well-governed countries around the EU, really focusing originally on Ukraine and the neighborhood policy kind of grew out of that. And now we have a crisis on our doorstep, which is par excellence what uh, the Lisbon Treaty arrangements were intended to deal with and apart from Macron's flight to Moscow, the EU is nowhere. So the argument is, shouldn't the EU rather confine itself to the area of its real strengths, trade policy and related measures to trade, the single market, flanking policies, competition, trying to go regulate big tech and all of that. And on the other hand, that NATO, as you suggested, you know, might have actually ironically received a boost from all of this, greater feeling of unity and that wouldn't it be better then for NATO or for the member governments individually or in coalitions of the willing to be the main focus for security and defense and the EU to get on with what it really does best. What do you think of that argument? Yeah, my experience in the two organizations is such that um, I think that neither organization is ready to accept a preliminary preemptive limitation of its own scope and range of activity. And in particular, since uh, NATO started moving a little bit into the, the EU territory, uh, you, you, I mean, I heard a lot over the past few years that we need more civilian means, we need to be able to integrate uh, civilian means and so on and so forth. Uh, and that the U.S. started moving in the, the other direction. We need to have military capabilities and, uh, and so on and so forth. We have to be able to manage crisis also in that field. Of course, uh, there is potential for cooperation, but there is potential also for competition and uh, overlap and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and clashes. Uh, uh, there have been cases in the past. Um, of course, each organization has to play to its own strengths. On the European side, I think uh, one... Uh, issue that gained uh, traction under the Trump administration was the hedging argument, as you know all too well, that is, what if uh, 
uh, the United States withdraws for NATO, withdraws for Europe, and so on and so forth. We need then to be able to step in. We need to have capabilities of our own. I think the whole discussion on strategic autonomy, to some extent, was a sort of uh, offshoot, a sort of spin-off of that kind of thing. And and I think some Europeans, at least, do not cannot still rule out hmm, that after Biden, hmm, that could be hmm, a different uh, uh, administration that could uh, revive uh, if not the letter, certainly the substance of the Trump approach in that particular respect. So I think that the hedging argument still does, still plays a role. Um, I read, the, the, as I said, the draft of the strategic compass. Um, there isn't much there. I think the only real proposal that emerges is this idea of uh, um, setting up brigades, uh, up to 5,000 men to be able to have uh, uh, quick uh, military operations when need be. Now, the logic behind that, if you like, is Afghanistan. Huh? When uh, the Americans withdrew from Afghanistan, uh, there were complaints that Europeans would not be able to uh, go there, uh, uh, gather people and take them out. And for that, it was necessary to have a certain capability. To it. It's not much, if you like, uh, on the big scale of, uh, of uh, military operations. The reason a, a precedent, precedent that is not encouraging is the battle groups. The battle groups uh, or battalions uh, were uh, launched by the French and the Brits in 2004 or 2005. Uh, they were officially launched uh, at the end of that decade. Uh, there are some 18 or 20 battalions on call on a list or on a rotational basis by the EU. They have never been used. Hmm? One of the reasons is that there was never a political uh, cohesion sufficient to decide to employ them. There was one call in 2011 during the Libyan crisis when there was a call for extracting some diplomats uh, from, uh, from Tripoli and, and, and elsewhere, but it failed. And one of the reasons was that the battalion that was on call, if I remember correctly, was Greece. And Greece at that time was in the midst of a, a terrible um, economic crisis. Uh, and since these battalions have to be paid by the country uh, that uh, uh, is in charge of them, Greece said, no way. I mean, we are under the joke uh, of the, the commission and the, and the fund, and we cannot do that. Uh, that was the one case I'm aware of. But of course, if you set up something, even on a, on a smaller scale, and you never use it, it's going to be comparatively difficult uh, to, to raise the stakes and say, no, we have to do more if you haven't done even that uh, at that stage. So I think that there are, uh, and the only other thing that I noticed in the draft is that strategic autonomy uh, pops up only once in 30 pages and in a sort of secondary uh, uh, phase. So does this mean that that very divisive concept is being set aside? Probably, uh, there is a need to save face so you cannot delete it completely, but I think that that uh, is not being said. And uh, as compared to previous documents of this kind, when it comes to partnerships, that is a very important element for the European Union, um, NATO is put on top of the list. Right? Uh, first NATO, then there is the UN, and then the regional organization, African Union, ASEAN, uh, OSCE, and so on and so forth. So for the first time, NATO is put on top, but at the same time, of course, it's more than being on top of the list. I mean, for the reasons we discussed, uh, I mean, it is in Europe, 21 countries are in common. Uh, one uh, lingering issue on this is, of course, uh, the UK after Brexit. Hmm? There still is no bilateral deal between London and Brussels, between the UK and the EU, on our future cooperation in security and defence. That may be a sort of inevitable at this stage. It's a sort of consequence of the climate in which Brexit took place, or the climate that still is there between uh, London and Brussels. But of course, uh, the UK was instrumental into launching the European security and defense policy alongside France. Uh, it has always been a rebalancer inside the European Union. It's now gone, uh, but we still don't know where it is on this. Uh, I can say from personal experience that inside NATO, the UK has never discouraged, never discouraged since Brexit, more cooperation with the EU, but from inside NATO. As UK, it hasn't, however, pursued any specific arrangement with uh, uh, the European Union on this. And it is not just security defense and, and intervention abroad, it's also um, homeland security. Hmm? I mean, the exchange of information about terrorism uh, and all that. And that is still uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, something that has not been discussed in detail so far.
Okay, um, a question from Ruth Santini. Um, I, I would be interested to hear your thoughts on medium long-term impact on EU security dynamics, uh, critical juncture for stepping up EU defense or relying more on NATO pressure on Germany to diversify more, diversify more for energy and other uh, of uh, Russian aggression, brinkmanship on Ukraine independently of a limited large scale Russian military invasion taking place or not. <sighs> Asking me if I have an opinion on that, I think nobody does. I mean, everybody <laughs> is trying to guess what might, might happen. Um, uh, speaking of what we were discussing uh, earlier, I don't know if you noticed, a few days ago, the US um, went public uh, by saying that, uh, first it was the UK, but then the US. The UK said, well, it is not unlikely that uh, the uh, that Russia would stage some incident in Ukraine okay. in order to have a pretext uh, to, to invade. And then a couple of days ago, I think the US, which was the, the, the Pentagon even, made it clear uh, that there was a, a, a little movie that was being prepared uh, with the actors and so on and so forth, showing an attack by Ukrainian forces against Russians uh, with uh, casualties and so on and so forth that could be used to that effect. Now, I found that fascinating. Huh? Um, I don't know if you remember a movie, but you're too young. I mean, maybe more senior people in the audience too, that came up some 20 years ago. It was titled Wack the Dog with Robert oh, yeah. De Niro yeah, right, and yeah. uh, Dustin Hoffman. Right. Yeah. It was about Hollywood staging a case that would yeah. allow the okay. US to go to war against the <laughs> country yeah. in Albania, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Uh, that time. It was a very funny movie, but it was. Uh, and here we are talking about something similar that is a sort of uh, uh, staged uh, product in order to do that. Now, the interesting thing is that the US went public about that. Uh, clearly, it is um, strategic communications, it is information warfare uh, on our side, but it's also a way of revealing that the US has access to internal communications inside Moscow. Hmm? Uh, now, that is the dilemma in these cases. If you show your hand, huh, you may have uh, uh, an important uh, deterring effect uh, in that respect, but at the same time, you, the other side now is aware that you have access to certain uh, sources and communication. In the Cold War, that would mean there is a spy, hmm? there is an informant, there's a fifth column among us. Here it's more technological, I think, uh, but it also shows that uh, these are also tools that are being used hmm, uh, in a diplomatic dispute in order to uh, prevent the war. Uh, and in the case of energy, I mentioned the, the, the discussion on LNG, huh? that is also strategic communication. So, I mean, we may uh, help Europeans to be more uh, independent in that, uh, in that domain. Wouldn't it be possible just to accuse the Russians of preparing that, whether or not it's true? And that would seem to be uh, kind well, of... Well, they even denied that they were the preparing uh, uh, an invasion, whereas yeah. there is uh, satellite evidence oh, that we really did. Uh, and of course, as I said, these are things that are quintessentially deniable. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that is part of the game. Uh, but I found it interesting that intelligence was used to preempt. Hmm? Uh, and Something. when you reveal your intelligence, uh, there are pros and cons. Huh? You have to be aware that, and it's difficult to attribute a cyber attack precisely because if you do it with certainty and quickly, you show that you know what happened and that you have access to the actions of the other side. Uh, so to some extent, you are telling them we are, we are watching you. Mm -hmm. And uh, it may not be wise uh, in some occasion. We want to keep uh, your information. Remember, if you remember, there is a, a very interesting moment in the, the movie, the simulation game, the one about uh, um, Enigma. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when um, uh, Alan Turing helped uh, the, the Allies decipher the famous Enigma code by the Nazis, uh -huh. Uh, and there is a moment in the movie when they do realize that the, the, the German uh, U-boats, the submarines, are about to attack a civilian convoy. And someone immediately says, we have to tell them they are being attacked. And then the military people say, watch out, wait, because if we tell them now, the Germans will know yeah. that we have deciphered the enigma. Hmm? Um, and then they decide not to uh, tell the convoy. So there is a sacrifice that is made in order to preserve the strategic advantage of, uh, of uh, the other side not knowing. <laughs> Sorry for my uh, cinema digressions. No, no. <laughs> um, can we take another 
question from the floor? Because we have another one waiting online, but okay. Um, Emma Bat, um, who's also in DC, thanks you for the presentation and says the current Ukraine crisis is testing you as approach to security and its ability to put forward United Front to security crises in its neighborhood. It may be too early to reflect on this, but what can you, you learn from this crisis and the way it engages in preventive diplomacy? Can you say it in one word? Um, maybe too early to reflect on this, but what can the EU learn from this crisis and yeah. the way it, engage, it, it engages in preemptive diplomacy? Mm. Well, perhaps it's really too early to tell because we don't know what is going to happen. Um, I think the, the, the Western side was surprised by the bluntness of the, the uh, Russian request. Uh, it's quite unusual to see something uh, done in writing with uh, a request to, for a, a, an immediate response in writing. Uh, I mean, that is not the way in which these things uh, normally happen. Um, there is an old uh, grievance on the part of Russia uh, to this effect. Uh, and there is a, a professor yet again at SAIS Washington, which has published a book. I read just the review last, uh, last weekend um, about the negotiations that took place at the end of the Cold War uh, between, in particular, the, the Bush administration, uh, George uh, uh, Herbert Bush, uh, and uh, and Gorbachev and the, the Soviet side, uh, and it, it was a, a known story. I think, I think Philip Zelikov public, uh, a book, published a book a few years ago. But now there is a professor called Sarot uh, at, at, uh, at Sarot, Sais, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the, uh, the title of the book is "Not One Inch," and apparently it's a quote from uh, um, a conversation that James Baker, then Secretary of State, had with Gorbachev, in which he basically said, well, if you allow us to integrate uh, East Germany peacefully into uh, not only Germany, but also NATO, uh, we can promise you that we will not move uh, military bases and military forces of NATO, not one inch into former Warsaw Pact territory. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems that the, the, the sentence was set, but there is no evidence of that being in the minutes and in the official documents of the negotiations over German unification, the two plus four. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, the Russian side took that as a sort of ethical um, commitment, sort of political and ethical commitment. And they started complaining about this. Uh, already during the, the first enlargement of NATO to uh, Poland, the Czech Republic and, and Hungary. Uh, but then uh, it was Yeltsin, uh, he desperately needed help from, uh, from the West for the economic and social crisis in the country, so it was played down. Uh, and when the Kosovo War happened, and there was apparently another affront to uh, the Russian uh, attitude on, on that occasion, and Putin became president uh, of Russia at the beginning, at the end of 2000, the narrative started to change. And instead of playing it down, they started playing it up. Uh, and they kept playing it uh, uh, up uh, more, uh, depending on the state of relations between uh, NATO, the West, and, and Russia. And I think that Putin is doing this consciously. Uh, it is an argument that plays very well with the domestic audience in, in, in Russia. Uh, and I think there are also people in the West and in Europe in particular, and Germany for, for one country, who think that that claim is not completely unjustified. Uh, now, of course, it is too late. I mean, NATO cannot uh, uh, backtrack uh, from a number of commitments that have been made. I personally believe that the way in which the Ukraine-Georgia issue was dealt with at the NATO summit in Bucharest in 2008 uh, was, uh, was uh, wrong. Uh, you know what happened. There was a, a summit in which enlargement of NATO had to be agreed, and the Bush administration, George W., put on the table also Ukraine and Georgia as candidates. And most Europeans opposed mm -hmm. that, uh, starting with France and Germany. And in the end, there was a sort of compromise, but again, a bad deal, uh, whereby uh, uh, Ukraine and Georgia, the communique said, will one day become members of NATO, but we are not going to do anything to make that happen anytime soon. That was the deal. Uh, and that was interpreted by Russia as a sort of invitation to act as soon as possible in Georgia, 
when in fact the war took place just a few months afterwards. And I think that also in the case of Ukraine, when it became clear that Ukraine was moving uh, after Maidan uh, more to the west to do preemptive strike in Crimea uh, and, and the Donbas. Uh, and uh, and uh, that story is going to, to remain in place. And I think there are a number of analysts who think that uh, there is some truth in what uh, is reported to have happened uh, in 1990 between James Baker and, uh, and Gorbachev. Yeah. I think we have, we have time for one more question. Yeah. It's a relatively long one from Tracy Robinson. Um, what level of concern is there regarding the recent Russian maritime military exercise off the northern coast of Ireland? The Russians have included in their exercise scenarios a special 350-foot oceanographic research vessel named the Yantar in the exercise. It is controlled and operated by Russia's main directorate of undersea research. It can carry and deploy manned and unmanned deep sea mini submersibles capable of supporting and conducting deep sea surveillance, espionage and sabotage operations. Is there concern about the transatlantic undersea fiber optic communications cables in the area of the exercise that connect North America to Europe? Well, the, the quick answer is yes, there is concern and undersea cables are a major uh, concerning the crisis management exercises that I mentioned, that was part of the scenario mm -hmm. that uh, uh, cyber optic uh, uh, cables under the Atlantic and in particular uh, under underneath uh, uh, Coldwell and going to to uh, Nordic Europe would be cut by by hostile uh, submarines to that effect. Um, I think that someone has published recently also the, the, the whole web of undersea cables to that effect. Uh, I still think that the maneuvers, maritime maneuvers uh, carried out by Russia are more a provocation and display of strength uh, rather than aimed at uh, any specific action at this stage. But of course, if the situation escalated and degenerated, I mean, they could also easily do that. It is a vulnerability, it's a major vulnerability. Uh, when all these undersea cables were put uh, under the Atlantic, there was no expectation that this could happen. Uh, and I think all our communication system is heavily reliant on that, and therefore that would be uh, a major crisis. Russia has been also quite able uh, at, uh, just like China, at insulating itself a little bit uh, from, uh, from uh, cyberspace. Uh, you know, China is the, 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 the firewall. Uh, that they can uh, have a sort of, a, a sort of insulated and isolated communication system in that respect. Uh, and Russia has managed to find a way to bring down the internet and have a sort of internal communication system where, whenever that is necessary. So they are also trying to shield themselves huh, from possible retaliation uh, operations that we carried out by, by, uh, by, by, by the Pentagon, by, by, by the the Americans in that respect. And I think that is one of the dangers of the situation. They could inflict harm without being harmed as much uh, in return. Uh, and I think there is acute awareness uh, of, uh, of all this. Um, I'm not in a, in a position to, uh, to, to say publicly what is being done <laughs> to prevent that or to, to uh, defend ourselves in that particular uh, domain. Well, importantly, that could potentially damage communication between Washington and Bologna, the size <laughs> campus. So I hope that doesn't happen. Well, maybe that is why <laughs> one of the primary goals. <laughs> I'm sure it's in a minute somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thanks uh, so much, Professor Misuroni, for a very interesting uh, conversation. And um, uh, thanks to everyone who asked questions. I thought we had some great questions, and I certainly learned a lot. So. Thanks very much. Thank you.